grace and peace to all of you joining us tonight. Thank you so much for being a part of what we're doing here at New Testament Church and the Gathering Echo at large with the website, with giving online, with everything that we're doing and everything that we're starting as this year is coming to a close very rapidly and we're moving into where we are in Christmas season and then it won't be very long that we will be in a brand new year with new hopes, new dreams, new visions of the future, and ways to share the gospel of Jesus Christ as it comes down or pertains to the love that God has shed abroad in our hearts, so we give that love back to everybody else. And that's a bit of what I want to talk about tonight. If, uh, if you didn't get to listen to this past Sunday, it sort of goes with what I'm going to talk about tonight, so like a good wine with a good Italian meal, it pairs nicely together. So you may find, or at least you may find, that it pairs nicely together. Um, particularly a Cabernet would go with, sorry, anyways, sorry, we don't have to talk about that. That might get people really sidetracked. However, we're here to talk about Jesus tonight and what he has done for us. See, the thing is, I, along with many others, we believe what Jesus did was when he said, it is finished, that it truly was finished. That what Jesus came to do, what he was purposed, designed, and intended to do, that when he said it is finished, he actually finished it. That there was nothing left for us to try and attempt in any way to garner favor with God, to appease the gods. Because if you take that mentality that is propagated by end-time prophet philosophizers or you know the false prophets of the day that want to talk about <clears throat> the world ending it makes absolutely zero sense and nowhere in this beautiful text that we call the bible nowhere will you find that god builds his beautiful creation and suddenly says you know what i'm done with these guys I think it's uh, time to call it a day, and we're going to go ahead and send them all to hell, or we're going to destroy the beautiful creation that I've made. You don't see God making the investment that he has made in creating all of us and having this beautiful world, and then suddenly just say, we're going to uproot the whole thing. It's all, it's all over. But what we do find, and those of us that practice or believe or teach a little bit of inaugurated eschatology, as people in the business call it now, and uh, uh, academia. Inaugurated eschatology means that when Jesus said it is finished, that not only did something get finished, but something got started. That's what inauguration means, that something is kicking off, that there's a brand new creation that is living and vibrant and moving, all because he said it is finished. When he finished it, he finished the work of God and kicked something off for every single one of us and something that I sort of talked about on Sunday was how Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. He looks across there. He sees this temple, which doesn't just represent a building, but represented ideas, represented a religious system. And it represented deep-seated and deeply rooted ideas that were very difficult to change. And even to this day, our own deep-seated dogmas, our ideas, our beliefs, everything that we hold on to so strongly, Jesus looks out at that temple that represents all of that, and he says, not one stone's going to get left standing on the other. And I think that that's what we're finding, at least with me. Uh, I found that in my own life, and my own practice, and in my own belief, that things that I had stacked so securely and firmly on top of each other to say, this is my beautiful box of God. And this is everything that I know about God. And I've stacked all my beliefs inside this beautiful box. God, look at how great it is and look at how well-defined I have made you. And God is like, okay, great. Good for you, buddy. That's not at all the, if you think that that's, that's the totality of everything that God is, you completely missed it. But that's what we do. And that's what we've seen through Times past, that's what we've seen from Christianity as it has morphed and transitioned into what it is today. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But uh, first, let me read a little bit of this to you. Um, 
in keeping with the same theme that I've just kind of uh, laid out here about what Jesus was saying and how the temple represented the dogmas and the doctrines that would attempt to sec- separate us from God, or at least say that we have separation from God. You find that a lot of these early church writers, a lot of the early church philosophers and teachers and theologians thought very differently than that. One of them being Clement of Alexandria, who said this, like I said, he's one of the very earliest Bible scholars from around the year 170 A.D. Clement of Alexandria said, we can set no limits to the agency of the Redeemer to redeem, to rescue, to disciple in his work, and so will he continue to operate after this life. All men are his, for either the Lord does not care for all men, or he does care for all. For he is Savior, not of some, and for others not. And how is he Savior and Lord, if not the Savior and Lord of all? For all things are arranged with a view to the salvation of the universe by the Lord of the universe, both generally and particularly. See, we take our strongly held beliefs and we try to find ways in which that it excludes people, or it leaves people out. That's a lot of what you find in some of the modern Calvinism that you see today. The thing is about somebody like Clement of Alexandria who is reading the Bible in its original language in Greek up until the year that usually it changed, or what you see through the history of the early church, they really stopped reading it in the Greek language around the years after the years 500, 600, 700 A.D., And then you begin to see people with motives translate the Bible into their own language or translate it with different additions. That's when we start seeing the codexes or different versions of the Bible with a lot of different stuff added in that was not there in the original text. And so the Muslims kind of get this right when they read their text and they speak it and they say it in the language that it was written in, which was Arabic. So they read the Quran and they speak the Quran in the original language that it was written so that it maintains the so that the words maintain their value thing is about the bible now it's been so convoluted and conflated with all of these ridiculous ideas all of this stuff that creates nothing but separation and delusion when jesus looks out and he tells his disciples aj reminded us of this today something that Francois had said, that Jesus tells them that day, he says, look out on the fields, they're white, ready to harvest. There's something that's out there ready to be gathered in. And I believe that it's today, at least, in my opinion, when I look out at Christianity and I look out at the world, see the harvest that's out there is people that are hungering for love. And if you see people out there who are desperate for love then what i hear is god saying the same thing or what jesus said thrust in your sickle and reap this harvest or pray that the lord of the harvest will send laborers into the harvest and i believe that because of something else that that francois had said to us and he had mentioned something about a farmer how a farmer will point out that a harvest is ripened when the seed that is in the ear matches the seed that was sown or the seed that's in the fruit of what is being grown matches the seed that was sown. Here's the thing. Good Lord, I'm really trying not to start busting into tears because I'm, I'm really going off my notes now and I'm just kind of just, I guess, just vibing with you for a moment because it just feels right. But Jesus is called by Paul multiple times the first fruits. He's called by Paul the first fruits. And when when I heard that phrase today from Francois of re, re-listening to one of those sermons from last year when he visited us this, about this time last year, and I'm listening to him say that, that you know that the, the harvest is ripe or it's ready to be harvested when the seed that's in the fruit matches the seed that was sown. Jesus being the first fruits before and among many brethren. 
being the first thing that could reproduce itself. That's what that means. The seed that's in the fruit matches the seed that is sown. So therefore, the fruit can now reproduce itself. It has the capabilities. It has the potential living within it, and it's called a seed. And when that fruit opens up and the seed goes into the earth, there the seed, yes, it abides alone, but it's the case on the outside that is already dead. There's something that's on the inside of it that is alive. And as it is in the earth, just like Jesus said, the seed abides there alone. But there's something much more value within that seed. There's a sprout. Something begins to grow and it pushes its way through the earth. It pushes its way through the dirt. And finally, it reaches sunlight. And as it reaches sunlight, it begins to grow and have even more nourishment and pull even more of the nutrients from the soil that it's been sown within. And it grows and grows into a tree a tree strong enough to bear fruit, and a fruit that also bears within it a seed. So now it is ripe, ready to be harvested because it can reproduce itself. Jesus being the first fruits of all of them that slept, being the first fruits of the dead, being the first fruits in every place that Paul called Jesus the first fruits, he is the one that could reproduce after himself. And that's what we all are. We are reproductions of Jesus Christ himself. We are all born after the image, the image and the brightness and the express image of the person of God. That is Jesus Christ. He was that original fruit that had seeds. And this is the thing about an apple. You can count how many seeds are in an apple, but you'll never be able to count how many trees are within the seeds. You'll never be able to count the amount of apples that will be able to grow from one seed planted that that would sprout into a tree, and that tree produces even more apples. You'll never be able to count or quantify the, the, the worlds that are there within in just an apple with all of its seeds. That's the same way with Jesus as the first fruits with us. When you get to the book of Revelation, he says, I saw a number that nobody could number. I saw a group gathered together that nobody could number. Why? Because in that seed, there dwells a multitude. In the seed, in the fruit that Jesus was as the first fruits, in the seed that was sown after him, there is a multitude, a number that cannot be numbered. And we are are in that number. We are in that group of people who have been gathered together in the presence of God. Okay. A little bit back to some notes, I guess. (laughs) So with what I was speaking about on Sunday, the Pharisees and the religious crowd, and speaking again of this whole fruit idea and this sowing idea, they're much better at producing like themselves. They're much better at reproducing more and more religious people that were just like them. They're very good at that. So Jesus looks out across the Mount of Olives, over the Mount of Olives, looks at that beautiful temple that was built, took 80 years to build, and says no stone is going to be even left standing upon another. Now, again, Matthew 24 is one of those uh, easily misinterpreted text if you read it in accordance with Darby and Larkin and uh, 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 Ribiella. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I can't remember now. Um, all of the you know early dispensationalists that came up with their ideas about 200 years ago. That's where a lot of that comes from, um, as opposed to what most people that would tell you today about dispensationalism or the rapture or any of those types of eschatologies. No, they've not been around since the beginning of the church. I hate to disappoint you with that little bit of information, but they've not been around since Clement or Origen or, you know, any of the early church fathers like Gregory of Nyssa. None of that existed then. Again, they read the Bible in the language that it was written. They read the Bible in its original Greek. So as the Bible gets translated into different languages and you have different motives, as we talked about a little bit of that on Sunday, different motives with people's Uh, different translations of the Bible, and you find out that people had 
over or superimposed their ideals upon the Scripture itself. And we find a lot of those from only about 200 years old that have really vastly and drastically influenced the church at large today, insomuch that you can barely even read Matthew 24 without thinking, oh my God, am I, am I really misinterpreting this myself? Because of all the stuff that we've heard year after year after year. But there's even, you know, the Oxford Annotated Bible points out that no, this is not about the Antichrist. This is not about the, uh, this is not about the false prophet or the beast or all the other things, like I, like I said, that again get conflated with all of these silly ideas and silly notions of God destroying the beautiful earth that he created. But just like we've reproduced that over and over and over again, the Pharisees were very good at that. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus was pointing to when he said that the temple was not going to be left standing, not one stone upon another. Now, that's a historical fact that happened in 70 A.D. That temple was, in fact, destroyed just as Jesus had said that day on the Mount of Olives. So he's not gathering us to a temple. God is not gathering us to a stationary object. God is not gathering us even to an institution. God has gathered us in the name of Jesus Christ. And he's gathered us into the presence of God. Gathered us into the presence of who God is and who God expressed himself as. And that was the person originally is Jesus Christ. So, because... He's not gathering us to an institution. Then that makes us ask the question, why would he gather us then to a presence? So let's talk a little bit about that. Now remember, I talked a little bit about this on Sunday, about ecclesia. Ecclesia being the Greek word that gets translated to the church. And again, that word church itself has gotten religitized a bit. That was something that I uh, came up with on Sunday. I don't know. I, don't, I really don't think that that's a real word. I sort of just said it on Sunday, but it's a, one of those words that just get. Uh, well, you know, it's it, the church has been the the word church at least has been religitized in such a way that it's lost. I think its actual truest meaning from what the Greek language actually said, which it was ecclesia, which we talked about Sunday. It means a calling out. Now the the traditional form of Calvinism would tell you that called out ones means that there's only a select few, that there's only a certain amount of people who are the elect. There's only a certain amount of people who are the chosen ones. Those are the called out group of people, and that doesn't include everybody. Now, I think that's a silly notion, especially if you read Matthew 16, which is one of the very first places where Jesus points out that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So Jesus is making it clear that his church, or his called out people, and that, again, it doesn't mean that, let's say that there's five people here, and I'm going to call out person number one and person number three. The rest of you can go to hell. (laughs) That's not what that means. That's not what it means to be called out. The word, exactly, yeah, phew, aren't you glad? <laughs> Jeff's glad that he's, you know, he's probably a person number two. So he's glad that all five people are included in that calling out. <clears throat> and that's the truth. That is the absolute truth because that's what the word ecclesia meant. It was a common word or phrase that they knew when the call has gone out by either a counselor or a legislator or a king or you name it, that means everybody come out of your house. Everybody gather to the town square because there's something, there's a message, or there's something that's going to be said that you are all a part of and you should all come and hear. That's what it meant to be called, or that's what the word ecclesia meant. Called out of your home, and like I tried to talk about on Sunday, called out of our dogmas, called out of our bulwarks that we hold of our stationary objects of Christianity or dogma or doctrine, be called out of all of that, called to the town square, called to the middle of town, because we're being gathered together. So that gives an entirely different view, in my opinion, of what it means to be gathered together. Let's read this. This is something that I I had read earlier this week 
from Francois writing about the ecclesia and talking about this out of Matthew 6. Well, it's, it's just referencing Matthew 16 here. But he's using and talking about the word ecclesia recorded in Matthew 16 when the same man, Simon, still known as the son of Jonah, discovers by revelation that beyond flesh and blood, the son of man is indeed the son of God. And if you remember that story right there in Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus is asking the disciples, whom do men say that I am? And then some say, well, you're Elijah. Some say you're Isaiah. Some say you're this, that, or the other, great prophet, rabbi, you name it. And then Jesus wants to know from the men that have been following him, and the men that he had gathered together, again, there's that phrase coming up again, the men that he had gathered unto himself, who do you say that I am? And it's Peter that points out, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus reflects on that with him and says, Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You did not learn this from an institution. You did not learn this from a religion. You did not learn this from synagogue. You did not learn this any in a temple. You didn't learn this by being sat or sat down and taught at an institution or a school. Instead, he said, my father has revealed this to you. My Father is the one that has made this known to you. What Peter had realized, this is what Francois writes about it. Peter had realized that he was indeed the Son of God. Jesus has come to introduce us to our authentic identity. This was his mission and what he was about to redeem. And then he tells Peter this, it's, or he references this out of Isaiah 51 and 1. Look to the rock from which you were hewn. Now that you realize who I am, allow me to introduce you to you, Mr. Rock. You're a chip off the old block, Petros, a little stone hewn out of the Petra or out of the rock, a mass of a rock. Jesus then uses the word ecclesia. And this is the way that he begins to translate the word ecclesia. Ek being source or out of and kaleo, which is to surname, literally meaning sourced or sourced in a name. So your authentic identity. So when he references that day, that flesh and blood had not revealed this to Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. For one, what Francois is pointing out in his translation, it's the calling out of the name called out and called out of, which technically would really be called into a name. And what is the name by which we've all been called and the name to which we've all been gathered? It is the name of Jesus. Jesus is the name that defines God. Jesus is the name that gives vision to the invisible God. At least that's the way John chapter 1 defines it. That Jesus is the one who has been declaring the Father all along. That by him all things consist. Without him was not anything made that was made. He is the one who is all in all. I hope that's enough Pauline scriptures for you to help give you some picture as to who Jesus is. What Jesus was representing, which was the fullness of God, the pleroma. Now, If Jesus was representing that, and we are the first fruits of that Jesus, then that reconnects us to our authentic design in God. And that is what Francois is saying in that passage as he translates that. And it's a fresh examining of the word ecclesia. So if we're going to have a fresh examination of the word ecclesia, we need to look at this idea about not being called, again, not called to institutions, not called to dogmas or called to doctrines or called to our theology, but called to the presence of God. That is the thing by which we will be able to see all men clearly. So Sunday I sort of started doing a little bit of maybe the dirty work of tearing down some sacred cows that would have surrounded Matthew 24 that's considered or called the Olivet Discourse. Again, it's uh, a series of passages that get 
really mixed up and really messed up when it comes to uh, so-called end-time prophecy. And it adds a lot of confusion for people. And maybe you're some of those folks, and maybe you're not. Maybe you, you're approaching this, and you're hearing this, and you're like, man, this guy has no idea what he's talking about. But just bear with me, and let's all maybe approach it the same way that I try to approach everything. What if I'm wrong? Um, so that's what I did years ago. I approached my deeply seated beliefs about eschatology, and instead of saying, I know it, I know it, I know it, I approached it by saying, well, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong about all this? Come to find out, I was. <laughs> and I found what I believe is a more hopeful way. Found what I believe is a way that expresses the inclusion of God, that expresses the work of Christ, and how universal the work of Christ was, and how wonderful it was. Hence the song that we would sing, the wonder-working power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I truly do believe in it. I truly do believe that what Jesus did was so powerful, so wonderful, and so great that there's not one person on this earth that it could not have included. So if you wanted me to go back and read that passage again from Clement of Alexandria, who said that he's either the Savior of all or he's not. And that's up to us to decide, I think. It's up for you to decide at least how you're going to live when it comes to that right there. But as I went through a little bit of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, you end up at, at the end of it, which is the culmination of it all in Matthew 25, which to me, and when you read it, and I think that anybody that's able to read it is able to see this is not an end-time prophecy. This is an, if you want to call it an end-time prophecy, if anything that it's an end of, it is the end of the religion and the religious ideals that keep us separated, and it is, a, it is the end to the religious blindness that keeps us from seeing what Jesus said, the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the stranger, and the prisoner. Those six categories. And at the end of that passage, it says, well, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, prisoner, stranger, or sick? When did we see you in any of those conditions? And he said, well, when you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And when you've not done it to the least of these, you've not done it unto me. You've ignored me when I was hungry and thirsty and sick and naked. You, you've ignored the actual person of Christ. And if anything that's being said from Matthew 24 to Matthew 25, it is that. It is the end of the religious blindness that makes you turn a blind eye to the man laying on the side of the road. But here is a Samaritan that sees somebody who's been damaged, beaten, and broken, and they're able to realize what A.J. was telling us through his song on Sunday, that I'm near the brokenhearted. I'm near those that are crushed. How is he near those that are crushed? He sends you. He sends me and he sends you out into the world to be near the brokenhearted. Instead, in that story, you have the religious guys see the man broken on the side of the road that crossed to the other side, completely ignore him. But here's somebody who has been ignored. Here's somebody who has been the outcast. Here's somebody who has been the half-breed, kicked out of the kingdom, and this Samaritan man can find no other better use of his time, his money, and his energy than to take this man who has been beaten and broken, place him on his own animal, and give him comfort and give him solace and pour oil into his wounds. Man, what a way to live your life. What a calling. What a purpose to see people that way. So if there is a sacred cow that's busted up out of Matthew 24, it is the religious ideas that keep us separated and keep us from gathering together into the presence of God, keep us from gathering in his name. While we're there, you might as well go ahead and knock out the sacred passage of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which goes along with that in my opinion again another one of those passages that gets completely misconstrued namely verse 17 
It's commonly translated in English phrases, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, what's interesting about that, again, now keep in mind the idea of gathering together. A first century reader of the Greek, and especially somebody in Thessalonica, now think about this for one, let's, before I get too far ahead of myself, maybe give you a little bit of backstory about the church in Thessalonica. That church was started in a very popular town that eventually became the capital city there. And ultimately, it was a melting pot of multiple cultures, and Christianity was the small little sliver of all of that that was on the rise. As it began to gain popularity, there are people from the Jewish sector of town that knew Paul and knew that he was someone that uh, had persecuted Christians for one who had killed people. They wanted to take up that same infidel mentality and kill people because they were saying that Jesus was the Messiah. They had aligned themselves much like they did when Jesus was alive. They aligned themselves with local Roman governors, local Ro Roman government. So then it was not only persecution from another religious side of town, but persecution from the government itself. So here are these people in Thessalonica who are hearing, for one, all of these messages from Paul, and it takes Paul confirming them and saying, don't lose hope. If anything, encourage one another with these words. That's the way that the story really ends there encourage one another because you've had during that time all of these because Thessalonica was a was a melting pot it had multiple religions and multiple religious ideas about you know what happens to you when you die and for them they were thinking well you know what do we do do we mix in all of these ideas together do we make a kind of an amalgamation of our belief with their belief and now we're just one big melting pot of belief as well and Paul's trying to help them understand that, no, that, that's not quite what it's about. Just maybe, maybe don't do that. Maybe don't try to mix your beliefs with everybody else. That's my, maybe not a great policy uh, because you're going to find some, some contradictions there. So Paul tries to get into those contradictions, and he starts saying, you know, because people were saying that the day of the Lord has already come. The day of the Lord had already arrived, and you guys missed it. You've been left behind, as you might say in modern language today, from some of the popular novels, fiction novels, mind you. Uh, make, make sure we point that out, that it is fiction. <laughs> but Paul is making it clear to them, no, you didn't miss the day of the Lord. <laughs> you didn't miss it at all. But what he talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2, he talks about being gathered in the presence and you go through some of that chapter there in 2 Thessalonians 2, and it talks about a wicked man, man of sin, and all of this kind of stuff. And again, that gets conflated into ideas about the Antichrist and the beast and false prophet, when really it's the exact same thing that's happening in the book of Revelation. It is a historical or prophetic critique. It's historical to us now, but it's a prophetic critique of the Roman Empire. You find that through Paul's writing, and you find that all through the writing of the book of Revelation. Well, we don't have, you know, I've, I've got maybe another 25 minutes left to talk to you, so I don't have another hour, two hours, well, actually, that would take way longer than a few hours, to go through the book of Revelation and go through all of the signs and symbols of Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 2 Thessalonians 2, but we can at least talk about what I think is actually being said there. Again, with that background of sort of knowing the persecution of the Thessalonican church, and how difficult it was for them to be Christians, and reading Paul's letters for the first time, and trying to have a little glimpse of hope in the middle of all of their difficulty. They would find these verses here, especially that one in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17. When we read that, especially in the King James language, we read it and see that it looks like we're floating up into the air, you're floating up into the sky and meeting the Lord somewhere ethereal or somewhere not even based in this air that we breathe. I can assure you that there is not one early Greek reader of that language that would have had that idea. And I can assure you of that because every single philosopher and Christian, uh, uh, Christian teacher after that never had that idea up until about 200 years ago 
uh, by, for one, you've got, well, again, like I said, we don't have time to get into all of that detail, but just trust me on that, or unless you want to talk to me later, you can send me some messages, and I can send you some information, and maybe we can even have a special session where we go through a lot of that, and maybe a special teaching where we can go through some of that history, but there are tons of books out there that can help you get through some of that history and help you get through uh, some of the, the well, I want to say silliness for one, get through some of the, the muddled stuff that, that sort of became this eschatology or this eschatological view. Now, when you would have read that as a first century Christian in Thessalonica, you would not have gotten that idea of floating away. Instead, is the Greek language actually says it's harpazo hamasun autos uh, in nepheli ace ho kurios, which is the word for Lord, ice air, so in the air. So caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's, that's what that translates to. The phrase was a commonly used phrase by people, especially Greek-speaking people and in that region. When a king would return from either a campaign, a battle, a victory, specifically, would return, everybody would be ecclesiad, they would be called out, everybody would get called out to the city, and they would go grab the king, hoist him up on shoulders, hoist him up into the air, and then they would bring him into the city. And the word harpazo, it means like to claim upon, to grab upon. That's the word that we use, or it's the word that's translated in uh, 1 Thessalonians as caught up. And to meet the Lord in the air, literally the word air, it literally means the air that you breathe, not the air that's further up. And I don't know if maybe you know this, I learned this in high school, that as you go up in the atmosphere, the thinner the atmosphere is, it's also when you go fly on a plane, that's why they have the windows shut, right? You can't go open a plane or you can't go open a window while you're up in the plane because you won't be able to breathe that type of air. So it's literally the air closest to the ground. And I'm, I'm saying this stuff, trying to say it as humbly as I can because I don't want to lose you in offense. But I'm also going to say exactly what I believe and what I found from Scripture. And it's taken me years to get through all of the, I say the muddled mess of theology that's out there that keeps people trapped in this idea of separation from God. And if you really get anything out of what I'm saying tonight, that is the main theme of what I want you to catch. It's less that I want you to catch even really about all of the facts and figures. And if you want to go through that, like I said, please reach out and let's, let's have a conversation about it or we can have a moment where we have a night of teaching. We can either live stream it or not or whatever makes it convenient for people to be able to get this truth. I'd love to go through that, and I think it's a, it's a fun thing, so maybe that's something that we can do sometime next year and go through the, the actual details. But the main thing that I think people should catch when you read the Scripture, especially when you read some of these passages to, or uh, uh, letters to a, a, a group of people gathered together in persecution, but still gathered together in the name of Jesus and gathered together and praying and believing in the hope that has changed their life. That's what I want you to catch. So, like I said, this would have been a common phrase used to describe what members of a small or even a large city would do when their king had returned from battle. Before making it into the city, they would all go out and meet him in the air, which is, again, where we get the phrase in English, an open-air meeting. Uh, meeting him was grasping or taking him as their own and parading him into the city. So yet again, another gathering, but not a gathering to abandon the God-forsaken earth or to float away into paradise, but to gather to a king who had conquered for us and for the people reading this of Thessalonica, gathered together to a king that had conquered death, hell, and the grave. And just like he had conquered death, hell, and the grave, and Jesus said, I've given you the keys of the kingdom. He had granted that to us. So here, these people suffering difficulty, suffering persecution, here is Paul telling them, go out and meet your king. Go out and take hold of your king. 
celebrate him, parade him through the city because he has given you the keys to his kingdom, given you the access into the kingdom itself. And what this does for us, again, not abandoning earth as God forsaken, but it reconstitutes the goodness that God declared about his creation in the beginning. Gives us the keys where we can reconstitute that goodness and restate in the same confession with God that the earth is good, the creation is good, and everything that God made is good. So, as a final point on at least that part of being gathered together, not to an institution, but to a presence. I already mentioned 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which again, it's another passage along with 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 24, and if you could say the book of Revelation as a whole, that is a, a, a prophetic critique of the Roman Empire and the difficulty that the Roman Empire would impose on those practicing Christianity or for re really religion at large. Because if you look through history, it wasn't just Christians that they were persecuting. It was really anybody that was not uh, devoting themselves to the religion of Rome, which was the spirit of Roma. One of the ways in which they would have to pay homage to Rome would be to go to a burning incense uh, uh, or a, 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 a thing of fire that had some incense in it with an image of the spirit of Rome, and they'd have to take that and throw it into the fire. Now, again, when you have some of these images that are listed in the book of Revelation, specifically the one that's, you know, 666, and knowing the number of man, the way that it's listed by, uh, by John of Revelation, when you break that down, you really do find out that the number 666 six, and six was just another enneagram of the name of Nero to the emperor. So when you read through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you find those same images talking about a beast or talking about a, uh, a wicked man. Now, for many people, they try to superimpose that onto the ideas that they have about the Antichrist when really what Paul was referencing sort of in secret mode or in, in a uh, I mean, cloaked mode so that they're not persecuted any further, he's referencing the Roman government. He's referencing people that are causing great persecution for them. So when you find those places in Scripture and the historical data that shows us what the writer was actually pointing to, they were pointing to situations that affected those people in their day. And like I said, the difficulty of the Thessalonican church was that they were a small subsect of a religious group surrounded by other larger religious groups who did not like their presence. They wanted to have, here we go, control. When religious ideas want to exhibit their control, we end up with what? Death. You end up with persecution. You end up slaying the very thing that is the hope of the nations. And just like I told you on Sunday from Acts chapter 7 when you have the story of Stephen telling them, and he goes through beautifully, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way to Moses and the law and the tabernacle, to Solomon building the temple, and then he looks at all of them and says, you stiff-necked people. He said, name a prophet that you haven't killed. You can't. You killed them all. And then what do they do? That statement alone enrages them. So much so that they kill even him. Because he was right. Religion, when it is exhibiting its control, or dogma, or doctrine, exhibiting control over people, there is no level or limit to which it will not go even to cause death in somebody. Now, one of the only places where death did not occur was when Jesus takes the woman who's caught in the act of adultery and he points to them again, any of you who have not sinned, and most of them possibly, probably had already committed the exact same sin for which they were accusing this woman and ready to stone her and ready to kill her. Anybody who had committed a sin, who's not committed a sin, Go for it. You've got full range. Throw the first stone. 
and the finger of God touches earth. The finger of God, as Jesus kneels down, stoops down, writes in the earth. The finger of God had touched earth that day. And so people were affected. This is what happens. People try to exhibit religious control. Again, it creates death. But this is the way that Jesus had shown us. And this is the way that Paul was attempting when he wrote his letters to these churches to give them some form of hope in the middle of all of this prophetic difficulty from at least the prophetic critique that they were giving of the empire or the people who were exhibiting, again, power over them. The important thing that he was trying to get them to focus on is the gathering to the presence. And the way that it's it's translated, at least in the English Bible, it's translated as the coming of the Lord. But really the word is perusia. And the way that that word really sounds, it sounds more like not someone is on their way. If I tell Jeff I'm coming to your house tonight, or you think, okay, all right, he's on his way, he's not here. Or if I knock on his door and I'm calling him saying, hey, I'm at your door, I'm here, uh, that's a different thing. That's what perusia is. Perusia is presence. So it's this idea of an already and a not yet that you might not feel the presence, but you can know that the presence exists. And you can know that what Jesus did was for everybody, that it included everyone. It was for all. And that God's presence is now filling the earth the way that it was read in the Old Testament at the knowledge of the glory of God. Not the glory of God. It's already covered the earth. But that the knowledge of the glory of God would cover the earth as the water covers the sea. So if I can take these last maybe 12 minutes to try and wrap this up for you. And I know sometimes this stuff, it gets a little hairy. It gets a little confusing. So again, I do ask, if this is something that you are interested in, please reach out and maybe we'll, again, have a night where we talk through this, whether it's a panel or just a teaching or whatever it is, have it on a, maybe even on a different night. It doesn't have to be a Wednesday. Just if it's something that you're interested in, please let me know and let's, let's discuss it. Overall, what I'm getting at, in this is John chapter 4 and 23 where Jesus is talking to the woman who has five different husbands the man that she was with was not her own and she's standing there at the well and Jesus says give me something to drink and she points out you have nothing to draw with this Samaritan woman this rejected woman mind you the fact that she had five husbands was not the fact that she was a Uh, a hoe or anything like that, as many people try to point out. More than likely, if you were a female and you had five different husbands, that means you've been put away and rejected by five different men. So it was not her fault, as she gets wrongfully blamed many times, as we do many women in our culture, especially in purity culture. We blame women for everything, when really it's probably the problem is the man. It's okay with me saying that. I'm a problem. Sometimes I'm a problem. I think we should all be okay with saying sometimes we're the problem. <clears throat> That's another topic. I don't have time for that. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. So here's this woman who's been put away five different times, rejected by five different men, not of her own choosing, but by somebody else. And here she is being received. Oh, man. Being received by a man and seeing that there's hope in his message and he asks for water she says you have nothing to draw with the well is deep and he says if you knew who i was you'd be asking me for something to drink and it was something that i'll give you and you'll never thirst again it amazes her it catches her off guard and then she starts talking about what do we usually do now this is so interesting to me in this story what do we do so many times when we in a very pure way Meet the kindness of Jesus. We bring up our religious practices. We say, just like she did, well, you know, we've got to worship in this mountain or that mountain. And, and you know, some, we gotta, for us, we, we didn't get to worship in Jerusalem. So, you know, we've got we to gotta worship in Gerizim. And, you know, we've got Gerizim and Ebal and all that kind of stuff. So you start bringing up the religious practices. That's what we do so many times. Well-meaning, though. Well-meaning. 
this is the way that I came to Jesus, or this is the way that I discovered God. And we start going through all of that stuff there. And this is what Jesus has to say about it. John 4, 23, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. For God is spirit, and those who worship him worship him in spirit and in truth. I really like the way Francois translates this in the mirror translation. It's John 4 and 23 says it this way. The end of an era has arrived. The future is here. Whatever, whatever prophetic values were expressed and external devotional forms and rituals are now eclipsed in true spirit worship from within, face to face with the Father, acknowledging our genesis in Him. This is His delight. The Father's desire is the worshiper more than the worship. <laughs> How beautiful. My goodness. And then when you read the way that he translates verse 24, God is spirit and not a holy mountain, not a sacred city with man-made shrines. Return to your source. The Father is our true fountainhead. You are not defined by your physical birth, your domestic life, your history, your culture, or your religion. So when we look at all of the places that we've set up as our divine place of worship, God is like, hey, thank you so much for that, but that's not what I was interested in. And that's what Stephen tried to get them to understand that day. You've devoted yourself to a temple. You've devoted yourself to a building. And you've devoted yourself to a structure, not just a physical structure, but a structure of belief that you refuse to abandon. When Jesus is telling us, I don't dwell in things made with men's hands, but he dwells in the hearts of men. That's what Jesus is telling this woman. You'll neither go to this mountain or that mountain. You won't have to worry about Ebal or Gerizim or Jerusalem or Mount Zion. You won't have to worry about a location. All you have to worry about, actually you have nothing at all to worry about. It's just that God wants you and that God has chosen you and that God loves you. You don't have to worry about your religious designs or your religious practices or what was uh, consistent for you as a child or whatever it was that, that you believe led you to Christ. Whatever it was, thank God that you have a, at least the basic knowledge of who Christ is. Now dive even deeper into that ocean of love. And let that water, let them feel like it surrounds you and submerse yourself into everything that is the love of God. Just like I was saying earlier about the seed. <clears throat> Excuse me. The harvest is ripe. And the harvest is ripest when the seed in the ear matches the seed that was sown. So, we, again, being the recipients of who Jesus was, the first fruits among many brethren, that we were all made partakers of his suffering, all made partakers of his death, all made partakers of his resurrection. Now, when he died, we died. When he rose, we rose. Now, these are not ideas that Brent came up with. These are ideas that Paul came up with. These are ideas that Athanasius, Clement of Alexandria, and Gregory of Nyssa, these, these early church writers, uh, Maximum the Confessor, that these are writings that they said of knowing their own connectedness to God in believing what Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, where he said, I pray that you make them one as we are one. See, they were crazy enough to believe it. What I want you to be is just as crazy. Whether that makes sense to you or not, I want you to be just as crazy to believe that you are one with God. And for the Thessalonican church, for them, it was in the middle of their persecution. For Jesus on the Mount of Olives, it was for them knowing that there were wars that were coming, that there was difficulty that was coming, and that Tiberius would eventually destroy the temple that they held sacred and held so dear. But even Peter would have to admit that his religious background and everything that he had been taught was really holding him back from seeing Jesus within somebody else. He almost did not go to the house of Cornelius. 
it took God showing him a vision three times for him to, and, and then somebody coming to his door to take him to the house of Cornelius to go and preach Jesus to the Gentiles. There he goes and does it. You also have this, and I think it's Acts chapter 17, where you have really the first Christian council where you've got all the religious leaders now, all the Christian leaders have gotten themselves together, and they're going to say, all right, well, what do we do about the Gentiles? Do we include them or not? They had to have a meeting about that. I think that's silly. That's in our Bible. But they had to have a meeting about whether to include the Gentiles in Christianity. And one of the things, obviously, that they were discussing was the religious practices that were being imposed upon the, the Gentile Christians, trying to match them up to the Jewish practices and the Jewish ways of doing things. Now, at least they came to a consensus there to say that all of our religious acts, they're not going to help us. They're not going to add us add any value to these brand new Gentile Christians who are not accustomed to you know things like circumcision and things like that that are kind of difficult for people to get a hold of. <coughs> I think though, whenever we try to impose again, impose our religious practices, impose doctrine in some way that creates control instead of the vast openness that is God, you end up with something that's a lot more convoluted and a lot more difficult. And what it does, I think it takes the, the burden and instead it puts it on us as a bearer of additional burdens that are unnecessary. Things that don't equate to life. Things that don't equate to true godliness or godlikeness. And I think in referencing that the harvest is ripe. It's ready to be harvested. It's ready for people to go out and love people. And just like I talked about out of Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus looks at those people and he says, the goats are the ill-omened people who have not seen the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the prisoner, and the stranger. But those that are the sheep that get to go to eternal life or get to feel or experience life eternal or life that does not even have a, an end or a beginning. It's just life. You're just experiencing life. Those are the people that have seen Christ in the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the prisoner, and the stranger. And sometimes that goes against some of our deeply held religious ideas about people whether they're accepted or not as they are, whether they're accepted for who they are. But I guarantee you, if you just love, you wrap your arms around people, you embrace humanity in all its various forms, I guarantee you will be infused with life. You will feel the life of Christ radiating through you as you offer love and hope to people who are having their own religious persecution. This is not the days of Thessalonica where we have the Roman government that is constantly uh, opposing us and causing us to die, but there's other types of persecution that people deal with. There's other types of difficulty that people are dealing with today. And just like Paul gave hope to those people in Thessalonica and said, comfort one another with these words, that you can go out and greet your king who has conquered death, hell, and the grave. You can go out and greet your king who has conquered all of your sickness and all of your difficulty and all of your trials and your troubles, who knows that you will in this life have difficulty. You will have tribulation, but he has overcome the world. Go out and greet that king in the air and you'll have somebody with you to go through all of that stuff with you. So, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. That's in the Bible, by the way. When I say things, sometimes I maybe forget to give you the, the scriptural reference of where it is, but sometimes I just quote these scriptures because I, you know, it just kind of lives within me. But that scripture just comes to mind that the fruit of righteousness is sown of peace and sown in peace of them that make peace. So go out and make peace with the world. Go out and make peace with your fellow men. Go out and embrace humanity and offer them the love that is found within Jesus Christ. I hope this has made some sense to you, and I hope that's at least 
the portion that you're able to get out of all of this is to go and love people. Why and how will we say it when we do it in benediction? So say it with me. I love him because he first loved me. God bless you. Thank you for joining us tonight.